sorry, I got distracted a little bit uh, towards the end of the video, but uh, as to what I checked, everything is in fact correct, only it's a little bit slow in the end, but uh, sorry for that. Okay, um, I also forgot to tell you something which I also wanted to show uh, with respect to uh, the numerical experiment that I did. And I had this maybe a little bit uh, strange theorem or remark, singular functions are low frequency for n small or sigma n large. So let's look at the computed um, um, singular functions once again. And here's one, here's the first eigenfunction. So that's U0 or U1, I don't know how we numbered it. I think it's uh, U1. So that's the eigenfunction for the for sigma 1, the largest singular value. And so the singular function for that. And you see that it's very slowly varying, right? So it's, it's a nice function. Now, um, let me look at the second one. Oops. Yeah. So this is the second uh, singular function, and you see that it's a little bit more varying, and uh, that's what I mean by it's a little bit os it's oscillating, right? I mean, in a way, it's oscillating, but it's oscillating very, very slowly. Okay, now let's get higher. And of course, I mean, we have sine of um, 10 times x or something, of, of 2 times x, so now we uh, the frequency goes up. And uh, let's look at the 50th singular function, which I um, computed numerically, and it's also it's already very bad, right? You see that the uh, the functions are oscillating faster and faster um, for for n getting higher or for the singular values getting smaller. And uh, this is something I of course cannot prove. I can prove it in this simple example, but. Um, it's, it's a fact that uh, almost all imaging operators that we look at really have this feature that they are small, that they are nice, they are very smooth, slowly varying functions when the uh, singular values are large and that they, they get oscillating when uh, the singular values get smaller. And this is something that we are going to discuss when uh, we have the formula for the um, least squares solution and the minimum norm solution, which we are going to derive now. Okay, let's assume that we wish to use, we wish to solve the inverse problem. Yes, I know. Ku equals g, and we have the singular value decomposition for k. Um, now, First of all, we uh, do not wish to solve it directly. It might not be solvable. So uh, we want to compute a uh, least square solution, which has to satisfy k star k u equals k star g. That's something we already proved. And also we want to compute the minimum norm solution to make that solution unique. And that means u should be in the range of K star. Now, uh, let me write down what K U is. K U was the sum of a sigma i scalar product of U and U i times V i. So that was the singular value decomposition for K and K star U or K star V is given by sum over all K sigma k uh, in v scalar product with vk times uk. Okay, so um, it's already clear what, what does uh, u is in the range of k adjoint. Uh, what does that mean? Um, well, it must be representable by the uk, right? I mean, if a u is representable by the uk, then uh, it's obviously in the range of k adjoint. You can see this here. Okay, um, so let's look at the first equation. K, uh, what is k star ku? For any u is nothing but uh, k star applied to ku. So that's the sum of all i, sigma i, scalar product of u and ui 
times vi. And since k adjoint is continuous, we can pull this in and we have something like summer or all i and we have k vi towards the end. So uh, that gives, gives us again the sigma i times ui. So we have something like sigma i squared u and ui times ui. Okay, now um, let's assume that in, um, some w and uh, that should be a least square solution in x. So uh, um, it has to be representable as uh, sum over all i, scalar product of w, and I am, um, let, me, let me write it in a different way. It has to be representable with some coefficients mu i over all i plus an element, plus uh, an uh, element in uh, u perp. And that's the kernel of k. And that's what uh, our representation theorem tells us. If there is a least square solution, then it can be represented as an infinite series of the ui plus some element in u perp. Okay, now let's um, insert that. Uh, if, a, if it is a least square solution, then it satisfies k star k w is equal to k star g. Now well, k star g, I should have pick g above, this is sum of all k, sigma k times g, scalar product with vk times uk, and k star kw, that's now the same as uh, k star k, I already computed, so sum of all sigma, uh, sum of all i, sigma i squared. Now, uh, the scalar product of w, and uh, first of all, um, the, the u perp, which we have in the uh, in the end, if I insert this in k star k, then uh, well, since u star uh, since u perp is uh, in the kernel of k, uh, that goes away. So I can completely forget about that. Um, and the rest is a scalar product of w with u i, but w is represented as sum of all i mu i u i. So if I take the scalar product, u i is an orthonormal basis, so an uh, orthonormal system. So this is nothing but mu i. And uh, then that's it. So what we Oh, now I have i's and k's, right? But uh, uh, for this to be the same, since uk is um, an orthonormal system, we have, it needs, we must have sigma, uh, let me take the k's, sigma k squared times mu k is the same as sigma k times scalar product of g and vk, which means that uh, mu k must be chosen as one over sigma k times the scalar product of g and vk. Now that means that our, um, our uh, least square solution, any least square solution in x can be represented as the sum over all i or over k, one over sigma k, scalar product of g and vk times uk plus an element in u perp. We'll talk about whether this exists in a second. Now, um, for w to be um, uh, min um, the minimum norm solution, well, it must be in the range of k star, but if you look at k star, it's already clear. Uh, from this equation. Oh no, not this one, the one above. Uh, some element is in the range if it's representable by the UK. So uh, the only way we can have a minimum norm solution is uh, the U perp is zero, and that means the minimum norm solution is given 
by W, sum over all K, one over sigma K, scalar product of G and VK times UK. Okay, um, so it's very easy to compute the, uh, sing the minimum norm solution given the singular value decomposition. Now, the question is, does this always exist? Well, from the analysis that we did, we already know that the least square solution does not always, there's not always a least square solution. So um, how can that be? I mean, we, we, wrote, we wrote down here the least square, uh, least square solution. Um, the only way it doesn't, uh, that doesn't exist is uh, the series is not convergent. And uh, let's look at what we actually have. We have this, we need to check whether this sum actually converges. And uh, if it doesn't converge, then we have no solution at all, right? Because this is required uh, for, the, uh, for the least square solution. So can we somehow guarantee that it always exists? Well, uh, let's do the same analysis as before. Um, since um, uh, since uh, G, is the sum over all G times, uh, oh no, no, excuse me, uh, the Bessel's uh, inequality uh, tells you that uh, the sum over all G and VK squared is smaller than the norm of G squared. So uh, that means the sum over all k, g, v, k times u, k exists, which is nice. And that's what we already used in the analysis of the, of the singular value decomposition. But now we have a 1 over sigma k over there. And we already know that sigma for infinite systems, so if we have an infinite singular system, so if we have an infinite number of singular values, then the sigma k tend to zero. Okay, but if the sigma k tends to zero, then that means that one over sigma k goes to infinity. And uh, so there is no bound on this multiplication over here. There is no bound on this, and that means it can do everything. It doesn't have to converge, and it's impossible to converge. Rather, what we need is that um, the sigma, if the sigma k go to um, go to zero very very fast, then this is almost guaranteed not to converge, unless the um, scalar product of g and v k tends to zero even faster, which we cannot ever guarantee. So. Um, we already see what the problem is. We can write down the singular value decomposition. With, with the help of the singular value decomposition, we can easily write down a formula for the minimum norm solution, but that minimum norm solution doesn't always exist. It doesn't, the series doesn't always converge. And we'll have to look at this in a little bit more detail, but we'll do that in the next lecture. So see you on Thursday. <laughs>